<laughs> Surely you must have some questions now. No? Okay, well, thanks for coming. <laughs> Where did you get the uh, rock and roll version of Halloween from? Oh, that's a good, I have no idea. <laughs> a library, you know, some music library probably. Yeah. This was a collaboration between the makeup effects department at my school and the filmmaker, the George Romero filmmaking program, you know, to, uh, to edit this and put the music behind it, you know. Uh, I, think, I still think it's kind of long. Here, this is Sluffy here, this uh, the greatest mask maker in the country, a guy named George Shell. Oh. He made this and sent it to me. Fluffy, of course, is the great creature that you saw. Um, no questions, really? Yeah. So a lot of um, what you've done was way before CGI was even thought of. Probably. It's happening right in front of you. So, so if you had the chance to do it over, all over in an age that CGI existed, and in other words, when you're coming up through filmmaking yeah. and special effects, um, would you rather do it with CGI? Or would I would. Rather... I would use CGI because yeah. it's a. I wish I had CGI when I was doing some of this stuff to hide an edge or, you know, because sometimes CGI is an economical decision. Like all the blood splatter that you saw, that's a lot of cleanup. So take two would take forever, you know. CGI blood, you just do it over and over again and the blood goes in later. So yeah, I would, I would use CGI. I love it when it's done well. Uh, you had a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, can you tell me about your special effects school? What's that about? Yeah, well, it's in Manesson, PA. Uh -huh. It's 16 months. Mm -hmm. It's a degree program. Parents love the fact that it's a degree program. Mm -hmm. And the students do this all day. Oh. You know, So if that's what they want to do, then, my, then the school is the place to be. But um, let's see, 16 months degree. Um, uh, and you become a special makeup effects artist. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's, I think it's a pretty damn good deal. Yeah. I thought I saw a question. Yeah, you had a question. What film are you most proud of? I'm sorry? What film are you most proud of? That I'm most proud of? Probably Creep Show because that was five movies. And it was me and a 17-year-old kid that did all that stuff. You know? The one I had the most fun with was Dust Till Dawn, only because of who I got to hang out with. George Clooney, Salma Hayek. My job for three days was to watch Salma do that snake dance. You know, so, you know somebody had to do it. Yeah, go ahead. Working on anything at the moment? Well, the last thing I did was the black phone. Yeah. Stephen right, right. Hawking. Yeah, I did the. I designed the masks on that one. Uh, just, just stuff at home for myself, you know, sculpting. I do a lot of painting. Yeah. Go ahead. Is there something that you haven't done that you want to do? Oh, a lot. Yeah, absolutely. I have a script of the most dangerous game that I love to direct. You know. Uh, and I have, I, have, I have three big zombie ideas that have never been done. Never in any of The Walking Dead, any of the zombie movies. These are three things that I think if they were in one movie would, would just be, you know, blow people away. Because I've never seen anything like this. But I'm not going to just give it away, you know. <laughs> I'm sure you're dying to yeah. know what they are. I'm not going to tell you filmmakers. <laughs> yeah. It'll be in your next project, you know. Yeah. So back there, somebody, yeah. Uh, I saw that you did a lot of acting in horror films, yeah. and is there something to keep in mind as an actor when, when approaching horror? Is it, it any different than the other genres? No, acting is acting. I mean, yeah. you're, 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 you know, pretending you're somebody else, you're believing, you're actually being that character, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, um, no, there's no difference. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I thought you had a question. Well, yeah. Uh, when uh, you are making the designing the, uh, the visual effects and all the makeup, how do you consider the story? Like, how do you combine both? Well, that's not my job, you know. Um, I'll go through a script and uh, I'll just look at the action sections, because that's where the effects are. And I'll make an effects list from that. And that list tells me what materials I need, how many people I have to hire, you know. And it's the director's job to tell the story, using what we do, you know, so. I don't really concern myself with that when I'm doing the facts, you know, that's somebody else's job. And unless, you know, unless it's censored, you know, I used to, I used to bitterly complain when they would cut something, you know. But then after I directed something, you understand, you know, this is your gig, you know, uh, uh, like Night of the Living Dead. You know, it, it's, it's me and George Romero's name on that thing, my Night of the Living Dead. And it's, it's sterile. 
there's hardly any effect in that. The stuff you saw in here was all cut from the movie, you know. So then the story became a big deal. That became the essence of the movie. You know, uh, yeah. Um, I'm writing a horror feature about, like, that happens in, like, a remote setting on a lake. And I saw that there of was course. a movie on the lake, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, I was wondering if th there are any movies you recommend in terms of that kind of setting, and or which one was that, the one where there was, like, a bunch of people uh, getting killed on... on oh, that, yeah, that was the burning, but they... Uh, that's just because they were all together on a rowboat, you know. Okay. Um, they weren't isolated anywhere where the killer was coming out of the woods and killing them like, you know, a Jason on the Friday the 13th. Um, what are the movies like that? Um, I never, uh, would you ever see Wolf Creek, the Australian thing? No. Yeah. Uh, there's been a couple like that. And, and they, the ones that I'm thinking of come out of Australia where people are trapped somewhere, you know. What about that movie Don't Breathe? Oh, yeah. yeah. You know? I've never seen it, but I heard a synopsis, and now I want to see it because mm -hmm. the 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 guy, oh, who Stephen Lang, is that his name? Yeah, he's a blind guy. Yeah, I don't want to spoil anything, but uh, he's a kick-ass blind guy. Mm -hmm. You know, and he, I want to see that. I want to see this how he does it. You know, in a movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What kind of zombies do you prefer? Because they have so many. So fast many, zombies. Yeah, you've suck. got the fast ones and then the no. ones that use tools. I'm like, seriously, they're dead. So they're how dead. do they do that? They're dead. <laughs> this, this, this piece of crap that Zack Snyder put out, yeah. Army of the Dead, yeah. a zombie got pregnant. Yeah. You know, they're saying words like respect. They're dead. <laughs> you know. And that and George. Or the George, World War Z ones, Ron and No, and I, I love no no you I like love those? I love the World War Z ones, yeah. Mm -hmm. That was a really unique presentation of mm -hmm. and this in the train from Busan did the They're same so thing fast. I don't know how they did that <laughs> stuff you know mm -hmm. so as a filmmaker yeah. that blew me away mm -hmm. um, but George Romero uh, used to sell bumper stickers that said fast zombies suck <laughs> <laughs> listen Jerry Gertley here has brought a lot of yeah. a lot of good things here one of the things he brought what's that fluffy thing this is an original pool from the fluffy mold that we used to create fluffy oh wow yeah. that's nice yeah. Mm -hmm. Foam latex, you know, and that was placed over an armature where all the mechanisms were to make it move. I even had prophylactics in the cheeks to make him breathe, you know. And Dar the the seventeen year old kid that was my assistant on Creep Show, he was he was fluffy because he was there. He was always going to be there, so we put fluffy on him and he acted the part, you know. Mm -hmm. But these are Jerry makes he made this mask. Yeah, I have all this stuff here. This is. Uh from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. If you're fans of that TV show, this is an Angel's Appliance and Spike's Appliance. These are ones that I had left over from the show. Um, that you can see they, they were like Lone Ranger masks where they just kind of went over the nose. And they were kind of generic so we could actually use these same pieces on background people so that we would save time. But this was uh, the ones that were created for Angel and Spike. And this on, is on, uh, on Day of the Dead, we spent our every morning making hundreds of these things, small, medium, and large. So if you walked to the set and you were going to be a zombie, well, you were medium, then we knew how to put the clients on you. And then we had teeth, small, medium, and large, you got your teeth. And these are actually <coughs> the casting of Angel's teeth. Angel was a character from Buffy, Buffy I guess. Right? And then he went off in his own spin-off series. What about these weapons here? All right, there's all types of weapons. This was from Flesh Eater. This was where a, a zombie, you know, Bill Heinzman hits this one kid in the head. And this ha actually had a piece on that would clip into your hair and had tubing on the side so it would spray blood. It's a lightweight uh, balsa wood. It was carved out of balsa wood, and this is just latex and polyfoam. So it was lightweight so it could be stuck into your head. But if we were going to do... Um like the girl with the axe in her head on Friday the 13th, or the machete zombie. We would shoot this, take it away, and then reverse, you know, it would go in. Yeah. And also, <coughs> also, you know, this is really lightweight. It's really lightweight. It's a new cleaver. It could be, you know, stuck in. There's all kinds of props. This is a monkey wrench from the Majorettes. You know, you could hit yourself with The Three Stooges had tons of weapons like this. This is rubber. That they would beat the crap out of each other with. Yeah, you know? knives. These are lightweight, they're just plastic. So you could actually cut this off and have it in there. 
Uh, you, you can't get cut with it, but you could put blood tubing on the back, so when they do this, the blood would squirt out. Well, another well, good thing about it, uh, because it's lightweight, if you did cut that off, you could attach it to an appliance on somebody's face. It's not like a real knife where the weight is going to pull it out. Sometimes we have to make them lightweight like this to do an effect like that. And you have, you know, props like this, you know, and you can... Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. Wow. Yeah, and there, it's, it's hollow uh, so that you could pump blood up through it and just... Uh -huh. you know. It's kind of what you did in, uh, you know, down the head. I uh, did a thing called Thumb Wars. Anybody familiar with Thumb Wars? Where Steve what Wilson decided to remix Star Wars with thumbs. Uh -huh. and <laughs> who did that? Who, who did that? Steve Odenkirk. Oh, okay. And he released it when uh, episode one came out. Oh, wow. Uh, so I had to make all these little thumb puppets. Uh, my boss at Optic Nerve just threw the script at me during the summer and says, here, you got two weeks, come up with this stuff. Wow. So we made these silicone thumbs that would slip over here. And these little puppets, you know, these thumb could move. Yeah. And I had really little armatures, and then the arms would, you know, move. And you could position them differently and put little weapons in their hands and have them, you know, do stuff. It's a living, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's cable controlled. And then this is very fragile. It's left over from a movie called Young Goodman Brown. And there was demons in it. It was based on a Nathaniel Hawthorne short story. This demon walks past this bush and he touches it and all the leaves turn black and shrivel up. Oh. So I had to make this thing. This is the only part that's left. It's just one of the branches, but it was a big bush. And when you pulled this... Wow, oh, that's so cool. cool. And they did a thing with the lighting where they put these different gels on and they turned black. Right. So... Uh, well, I did a movie once where they had to see a plant wither and die. And they did it with time lapse. They put a, a light on the plant and it took a couple of days yeah. before it withered and, and died. Uh -huh. And this little guy here, this was from Young Goodman Brown. Mm. And uh, actually, Bob Tennell was a producer of Young Goodman Brown. So I really? just met him in yeah, 1991. Uh, this is a little pot belly pig puppet. And what they was, the director came up with this idea that witches will suckle pigs. So he wanted this. Wait, wait, wait. Witches will what? Suckle pigs. Suckle pigs. Breastfeed them. Okay. Yeah, so okay. uh, he wanted to see with this witch breastfeeding a pig. So they, the animal wrangler didn't have a pot belly pig, so he had went out and bought one, but he didn't have time to train it. So every time they handed it to this woman, it would scream its head off. They'd take <laughs> it away and shut up. They'd hand it back, it would scream its head off, and they'd take it away and it would shut up. And they'd hand it back and it bit her in the breast, and she dropped it, and the director goes, that's it, that's it, we're losing our light. He comes up to me and he goes, can you make me a pig in, in two days? And just anything. I don't care if it's a fur with an eyeball in it. We'll shoot it real dark. When they say that, you know they're going to shoot it in a close-up. So I went back to my hotel room. <laughs> and I made this little pig. Does he it, suckle? Yes, he does. Oh, it's right. A, it's an actual puppet. You can get your hand up in here. And I have big hands. She had little hands. Let's see if it still works. Okay. I've never seen this thing. That's pretty cute. <laughs> <laughs> What is it made of? It's latex and polyfoam. Mm. I had to make it in like two days. I just went to the craft store and bought these little eyes. You know, they used to sell cool eyes at Michael's. And well, the same thing was true on Monkey Shines. You know, the, the real monkeys on that movie would do your taxes, make you dinner, and figure out M equals MC you know, squared. But when George said action, they just sat there, okay? Uh -huh. So we had to make rubber monkeys. It's the rubber monkeys mostly that did all the stuff in Monkey yeah. Shines. And I worked on Babylon 5. This is, uh, I saved this. This was uh, one of the characters I did called Jakar. And in the, the one episode, he got his eye ripped out. And uh, the, the appliance, instead of redoing a whole new appliance, we just made a prosthetic that could glue onto this prosthetic. And uh, this was his actual face. And this was the cow that went with it. He was uh, of the Narn race. So this would go over the cow. Yeah, this would go over here. This isn't his, this is another Narn, but yeah, this is yeah. the way it would work. And it would glue on like that. Mm -hmm. So you can reuse these and, you know, we'd get, you know, several, you know, times we'd use it and then we'd have to send it back to the shop to get repainted. But, but these, you couldn't, you, you couldn't reuse these because the edge, right, the, once the, the edge face, is destroyed, yeah. The face had to be redone. But I would pre-paint these. I would make a bunch of them and pre-paint them so they would be ready to go. 
That's from surrogates. That's K&B did that. It's a silicone prosthetic. Yeah, this is silicone rubber with a vinyl skin. And this is the kind of stuff they use. This, these are foam rubber, but uh, K&B sent these to the school, K&B effects. So uh, they're very, very soft, like skin. It's like a little severed hand here. Yeah, a severed hand. It's from a movie called Blood Dreams that I did early on. This was from the movie Tom did. Remember this? From uh, Heartstopper, when they pounded the steak in the Kevin, Kevin? Kevin's chest. Oh, so that's the actual... That's the actual one. Yeah, that's worth a fortune. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hang on to it. <laughs> All right. Well, what it was is uh, they changed the schedule around, and it was about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and uh, Tom gets a phone call. Oh, we're going to shoot that staking scene tomorrow. And remember that? And they, I don't, it was no. supposed to be weeks later. Oh. And so overnight, I mean, in the afternoon. Let me see after, the bottom part of that. All right. So this was, this was fastened to him. And you made a bladder that went around there. So this would bleed, in, yeah. So it would gush blood. And this so, was dental acrylic. Right. And I, what I did was I took a piece of wood and beat it all up and made an alginate mold and poured dental acrylic in there. So for the scene, when the steak, they pounded the steak on him, all they did was this would just, yeah, yeah. and then it would bleed. Uh -huh. Okay. And it was, uh, it was funny because they, they wanted the actor to do it. And what, what, the way it would work is you'd put your hand around it like this, and then you could pound it down. Yeah. And the actor couldn't do it. So what they, they got so frustrated, they made him take his shirt off, made me put the shirt on, and, and, and you did. actually pound it in. So. But it would go down into his chest. Well, so and then when you take his hand away, Tom would pump the blood all out around there. And so what, so Kevin couldn't hold it right or something? No, it was glued to his chest. But the actor that was supposed to pound it into his chest oh, oh, kept okay. screwing it up. Yeah. He, couldn't, he couldn't hold it like this and pound it down into his hand. Well, I should have done Martin that way because in Martin, uh, the, the, the steak went, you know, between his arm and his chest, uh -huh. and it looked like it was going in. But in the movie, he pounded all the way in. Then they cut to Martin, and the steak is sticking out like this much. It's a huge mistake. You know. <laughs> Somebody else had questions. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, you're. Uh, oh, I forgot to go. Hey, um, you showed a lot of gunshots. How you stayed the gunshot? Well, it depends, you know. I mean, sometimes, like on um, when I did Night of the Living Dead, my version, there's a lot of head hits in there. The effects guy, it was a mechanical effects guy, he would take breakaway glass, you know, breakaway bottles and stuff like that. He would melt that material down and put it in a, 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 a ball, a little ball mold. And he would make a, a hollow ball of that material, the breakaway glass and fill it with blood, and then blow it. I could blow it right from here and smack you right in the forehead. That's how accurate it is with a, a copper tube, you know? So that's what they do. And I said, you know, you should test that. Let me, let me do it to me first yeah. before you do it to an actor. And he made it way too thick. Because, oh. you know, I had a lump on my head. <laughs> we can't do this to actors, you know, so. <laughs> then he made it very thin and they, they shattered. And it depends. I mean, Jerry's in a has a federal, ex we, I had it, we both had federal explosives license. He still has his. And that's the only way you can buy uh, real squibs, explosive charges. You go in a, uh, on a metal plate, let's say, with a blood bag over it for the bullet hits. That's one way of doing it. But Dawn of the Dead was very primitive. I would take a, a sewing button and put fish line through it and glue it to somebody's head over a black back black paint, cover it with mortician's wax, and just pull it. And so the whole, because all it needed was a hole to appear. Right. You know, that's basically what we teach the students at the school. What do I need to do? <coughs> Excuse me. What do I need to do? What do I need to see to make you believe that what I'm, what do you need to see to make you believe what you're seeing is really happening? Mm -hmm. And that's what a magician does. That's how he fools you. Mm -hmm. And we have mechanical devices you're not aware of. So, the script said, you know, with a bullet hit, I need to see a hole appear. Well, how would I do that, you know? So the button pulled through the wax, made the hole appear, and then we pumped blood through it, you know? But that's basically the science behind all of this. Um, well, like I said, the same thing a magician does. To make you believe what you're seeing is really happening. 
Did that, did yeah. that, go ahead. So with the stuff, can you like buy it from your store or from your school? Uh, or buy, what, buy what from the school? Like any, any of these things you're talking about with the proper... No, no, you gotta make that stuff. You have to make Yeah, you gotta make that stuff. Okay, so like these nine things that you can sell. No, we don't, we don't sell anything there, you know. Uh, Does your school have like a, an internship program? A what program? Like internship? We used program. to have an apprenticeship thing. You had to have so many hours of apprenticeship, but I don't think we do that anymore. Because, you know, we, uh, at, at the time, we had Tom Savini's Terror Mania, the haunted attraction. And you could go, you could go in one week, wipe out your apprenticeship, you know, with 100 hours. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's not there anymore. But, um, yeah, what else? Uh, we, don't, we don't do the apprenticeship thing anymore, do we? No. Yeah. We haven't done that for a long time. Yeah, you had to have 100 hours to graduate. Go ahead. Tom, when do you think uh, special effects artists should get involved uh, in the filmmaking process? The earlier the better, like development? Or it has to be the earlier the better. Okay. Before Creepshow, we had three months to build all that stuff. You know, we to build Fluffy, to build Nate's corpse coming out of the tomb. Uh, um, yeah, it took a long time to prep that. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you, you got a schedule. Oh, Nate's corpse comes here, so that's got to be... See, here's the thing. An artist is never done, but you have a deadline. And that happens constantly in this business. you got to be ready for that. And that disappoints a lot of artists. What? I'm not done yet. Well, an artist is never done, but time is up. Okay? You had a question, right? Yeah, yeah you mentioned earlier, uh, when you did Creepshow and Floppy, that the editor cut out a lot of stuff. Or, or he made it appear... In the end, or something, something well, he didn't cut it. He never put it in. We're talking about Paul Hirsch, yeah, Paul Hirsch, the editor of Star Wars. Shoot a lot of stuff that wasn't in, in the. No, pretty much all my stuff goes in there. On uh, on Friday the Thirteenth Part Four, the director made every effect quick. I mean, you knew what was going on, so he could dwell on Jason's death sliding down the machete. That's the only way he got away with that with a rating board. Just everything else was quick. You know? mm. And sometimes they don't even change. The, the, they'll come in and tell you what you have to change. You know, uh, uh, Mike uh, Scorsese on Taxi Driver, they, you know, he was going to get an R, you know, an R rating or an X rating. All they did was change the color of the blood. He made it browner, and you know, they thought they bought it. Sometimes they give you all these notes. Okay, yeah, sure. That's the truth. Mel Brooks will tell you that. Here's how they answer. Remember he said that? He said, no matter what they said, oh, yes, yes, okay, we'll do it. And then you don't do it, and they don't even know. You know so. <laughs> Yeah, that was a, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did the color of blood change as the years went oh, by? Because yeah. it looked like earlier it was more pinkish color. Dawn of the Dead, Dawn of the Dead was the worst blood I've ever seen. And I did it. Yeah, oh, right. you know, it, it came in a bottle from the 3M company, Sage Blood. It looked great in the bottle, but it photographed like melted crayons and uh -huh. strawberry Kool-Aid. It was horrible. But Dick Smith... Dick Smith is the greatest makeup artist who's ever lived. Everything we do, he invented. Dick Smith did The Godfather, The Exorcist, Midnight Cowboy. You know, he, he, he invented all the stuff we do. His blood formula is the formula that we use, okay? Now, this is how I learned some things. Um, I was a combat photographer in Vietnam. So there's a couple, you know, I saw a lot of cadavers. And this is why I hate in certain movies when an actor is supposed to play dead. You know, he closes his mouth and he tries to look pretty for the camera. Mm -hmm. Cadavers, you're dead. No muscles work, including your jaw muscles. The jaw is always slack and the eyes are always open. It takes a muscle contraction to close the eyes. So somebody playing dead with, you know, slack jaw and eyes wide open, they're doing a good job. That's the way it really looks, okay? Um, also, the blood, within 24 hours, turns dark brown. So if there's a crime scene in the movie and they go there the next day and the blood's all red, you know, they're not doing any research, you know, this is a big mistake. Um, so um, what else? I went off on a tangent there, yeah. Oh, Sorry. Go ahead, I'll get you the second. Uh, you have an answer. Which film did you wish you have done and also which director would you like to work with? Which film would I like to have done? Yeah. Like I'm kidding, I did do them. No, 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 I know, but like a film that you didn't do that. Oh, like, but I didn't well, do. I, I wish I had done that. Oh, oh, well, every, every single one of them. <laughs> <laughs> every film I've ever seen, every makeup effect you know, I've ever seen, uh, yeah, all of them, just about. Um, but if I could redo something, I would, the, the blood and dawn of the dead, yeah. 
Did you have a question? Yeah. Um, other than your films, what film have you seen that has the best special effects? What film have I seen that had the best? Well, probably one of Dick Smith's Altered States, Exorcist. The Exorcist was full of really terrific stuff, you know. Altered States, same thing. Um, uh, and, you know, Rick Baker. I mean, these are, it's like, it's like an exhibit from your favorite artist. If uh, Rick Baker did a movie, you know, or American World, well, I got to, you know, got to go see that. It's like, you know, an exhibit from your favorite uh, makeup artist. And we're a brotherhood. I mean, there's no competition. Well, there used to not be competition. <laughs> when I was doing it, there were like eight of us. You know, me, Stan Winston, Rick Baker, Steve Johnson. Now there's hundreds of them. You, know, so. you had a question back there? Yeah, I mean, I, I think about you both as leaders uh, and um, artists, but also as leaders of a department on a film project when you're working as an effects artist. So, so I recognize that each projects sort of need different groups, but who are some of the people, not their names, but the job titles under you that you end up when you're doing uh, effects for a, a decent sized project, who are you working with and what are their jobs? Well, you're working with the costume department and sometimes that doesn't work. Hmm. On Creep Show, you know, uh, the skeleton at the window was a real skeleton that I bought from India. The box arrived and it said a product of India. It's a real skeleton. And I hid all the mechanisms within the skeleton so if, if light shined through him, you wouldn't see any mechanism. So I asked the costume people to make the costume as sheer chiffon, as sheer as possible so when the lightning did strike, you would see through the real skeleton. Mm -hmm. And he's moving. Well, how the hell is he doing that? Well, they put a fucking carpet on him, you know, oh. and they hid all that stuff. Nate's corpse when he comes out of the ground. You know, this was John Amplis, one of my friends as an actor. And I told the costume department, his costume should be to complete the effect. It should be two or three sizes larger than what he wears. So he would look emaciated within it. I gave him the skin tight. Anyway, it was a nightmare. Mm -hmm. So you're working with a department like that. But usually, I mean, that's really, to me, the only time that stuff has ever happened. You know, because everybody is trying to get the effect on the screen. But I'm glad you asked that because one of the things we do with the school is a class called, in the third semester, it's called Page to Screen. And the teacher, he is pretending, not pretending, he actually, the premise is the teacher is a makeup effects guy who owns a studio and he's hired you guys, the students, to help him do the effects on this movie. So they're working on the movie working for the effects guy, and that, we teach that class because that's what's going to happen when they leave the school. They get into that situation. They're going to be working for an effects guy or starting their own studio, you know, and trying to get the effects done for some particular project or movie, you know, whatever. Um, did, did I miss somebody? Yeah, way back here, I can't see. Hey, Valley. Um, so, I know you were talking earlier about like it being a brotherhood and it's not super competitive, but it used to be. Um, but for people who are like just maybe starting out in the industry, how competitive would you say it's like both of you? <coughs> well, I guess it depends. Today, you're, you're going to get hired immediately because you can hardly find anybody to help them anymore. The guys in LA, you know, our students are getting work all over the place because of that, you know. But competitive wise, you know, it's just, it depends on your portfolio. I mean, there used to be no formula for success. But today, it's photograph everything you do, put it in a portfolio, and put that portfolio in front of somebody that can help or hire you. You know, I used to carry a list, I don't have it with me, a list of all the movies and TV shows and mass companies, toy companies, haunted, haunted attractions, that are students where they work, okay? Now, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I, I read that list off to the incoming students, and tell them what's the difference between these people and you sitting here. Well, one, you haven't gone through the training, and two, they obviously put their portfolio in front of somebody to get that job, okay? So that's the formula for success. When I first got interested in makeup effects, I think I'm 11, 12, you know, I was putting makeup on myself. I would go to school with half my eyebrows missing, nose putty in my hair for two weeks, you know. Then I realized I could make up my friends, you know, so that they would go home with, half their head burned, but makeup, you know. And the parents are like, who did that? So we, well, you can't play with him anymore, you know. <laughs> um, but no, I, so I, but I, I had to learn that way because people were not sharing their secrets when I was growing up. 
it was a stage makeup book that was pretty helpful, you know. But now there's so many books out there, and uh, uh, and the school. I wish the school existed when I was trying to learn makeup with them. Again, it's 16 months. We're not kidding around. There are other programs that are like 11 weeks. They charge more than we do. You know, we're 16 months. You know, and, and I don't think you can even learn, learn it all even in that amount of time. You know. So, but to answer your question, yeah, um, books, experimenting. And then, um, well, when I did Creep Show, I had no idea how to make fluffy. I had no idea how to make an animatronic creature that would, this face, would have facial expressions and, you know, movement and stuff like that. So I called Rob Bottin. If you haven't heard of Rob Bottin, he did the howling, he did the thing. He's a, he, at one time, he was like the top guy. And I, for two hours on the phone, he told me how to do it, you know. And then I went to L.A. for the premiere of Night Riders, and he showed up, took me to his house, tore the skins off all the heads from the howling, and showed me how the mechanisms work. So that's how I learned, because I had never done one before. And that's why the school exists, to show people how to do this stuff, you know. Because yeah, I get letters from kids. They glued a sponge to their head and poured blood over it. And it's on a letterhead, Joe Blow's Special Makeup Effects Studio. He knows nothing about effects, you know, but he wants to be a special makeup effects artist, you know, so, and that's why we exist. Am I missing anything? Yeah, go ahead. Um, could you talk about the importance of, like, the post-production process and making your special effects and makeup really come through on screen, like, with sound and editing? And well, you know, our stuff is done on the set, mm -hmm. you know, um, unless there's visual, like, it happens on The Walking Dead all the time. There was a scene where all our heroes were kneeling down near a trough and people were getting banged on the head and their throats were cut, you know. Um, they glued tubing to their necks for the blood to shoot out, you know. And they didn't even bother covering it because they knew in post-production they would just erase the tubing, okay? Wow. So and that was pretty good and that saved a lot of time. <coughs> and that happens a lot. Um, the bicycle zombie girl She's just wearing green pants and they erased her legs later in post-production. So if you know that that's the ultimate goal, then you are involved, of course, in the post-production. But everything I've done, it happened, it's happening right in front of you. Rick Baker's werewolf transformation in American Werewolf, that happened right in front of you. Um, no CGI. But it, like I said, it is a good tool and I love it when it's done well. Yeah? What do you think... Um does Pittsburgh have a role, or do you foresee anything with like um, with all the movies coming here and mm -hmm. stuff like that? Like, um, would you like to see more? I mean, made here. I don't do you care. feel? Do you feel like? Um, you no, know? I don't care because they don't call us. No. By the time they get here, they find other people, and they right. find them, you know, very rarely. Like when they did uh, Silence of the Lambs here. Yeah. They asked if we would do the butterfly guy on the cage that that yeah, Anthony Hopkins the killed. Guy, yeah. yeah, and uh, and we had a studio. Did you work on that? I worked. I was second unit of makeup on the sound story. Okay, so. Yeah. But they normally, by the time they get here, they've hired all their own people and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, if they did their research, they would look for somebody <laughs> that does special effects near them. It saves them hotel and travel and you know, that stuff. Mm -hmm. you know, so. um, do I wish more stuff would come here? Sure, of course. I live here. And um, it's just exciting to, to see it, you know. Yeah? Oh, what's your day rate? We wanted to hire you. <laughs> <laughs> One million dollars. <laughs> um, call my agent. <laughs> yeah. No, there's, um, my agent works very hard to get me five grand a day. Okay. You're not with the IRS, are you? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> and I use that excuse because I get a lot of offers. Hey man, we have a thousand dollars. Can you? Uh, well, you know, my agent works very hard to get me blah blah. You know, and then they'll usually. Oh, this that's another. It's a good question because our students ask, "How do we price ourselves? What's our? How, how do we do a day rate?" I said, "If someone's asking you for a job, tell them to make you an offer. Yeah. Don't ever give them a rate. You know, because yeah. then you're stuck with that. Okay. Mm -hmm. But most of the time, you say, "Make me an offer." They offer you five times what you would have asked for, you know? <laughs> so that's the smart thing to do business-wise, you know, as far as day rates go, yeah. Make me an offer. And sometimes, it's, if it's not as much as you want, then 
Then you tell them what you really want. And they'll try to get it, yeah. So if you have a student coming out in your school <coughs> and we're making a short film with no budget, what would be a fair thing to like, offer them? To offer them? Yeah, like... Well, they're, they're going to probably want to do it no matter what, you know, okay. so, yeah. Uh, you can get away with murder with that, yeah. As long as you pay for the materials. Yeah, pay for What's that? Material costs. Well, for sure. As long as you pay for the materials, you know. Yeah, a lot of times they'll just do it just because they want to if you pay for materials. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> but you're talking about a kid like right out of the school, okay, you know. Or while they're in school, you know. Or a, lot of, a lot of students get jobs while they're still in school. We've had people that didn't even graduate because they got a job in some Hollywood movie somewhere, you know. A guy named Darren Holt. And a lot of times they show up like Darren Holt, they've never sculpted before. You put a blob of clay in them, in front of them, and they all of a sudden this thing, they, this thing that they had inside them that they created, it's amazing. They didn't know they had the power, you know? And that happens a lot with people who've never sculpted before. Because makeup, this is all sculpture. This is sculpted, you know, just about everything on this table. Sometimes the weapons, you know. It begins with sculpture. And if you think, well, I'm not a good sculptor. Well, I bet you don't know that yet, you know, until a blob of clay gets, clay gets put in front of you. Yeah. Happens all the time. Anybody else? <coughs> yeah. Um, so I actually graduated from your school in um, 2014. I want to say thank you for having school because I've got so many cool gigs after that. Oh, good. Glad to hear. Um, but I did have a question. So would you ever consider having a second location? No, why would we compete with ourselves? No, I'm just saying, like, some people are... No, they, we get asked that, but can we have a school in California? They yeah, come from California. Like closer, closer to the city, maybe? Okay. Yeah, well... Or like a studio or something. Yeah, well, you know, when the, when the school first opened 23 years ago, mm -hmm. Jerry came in and said, what? There's going to be a school here? This is July. The school was supposed to start in October. You know, you know tumbleweeds were blowing across the road. It was a ghost town, you know? Mm -hmm. But you know, we got we put, we pulled it together and got an apple. Wait, what's the point? There's something I was trying to get to. Um, location. The location. Oh, okay, yeah. It's in the middle well, of because, nowhere where you don't have anything else to do except make Well, that's the thing. The students, <laughs> the students would come to me and they would say, Why are we here? And I would say, So you're not distracted. <laughs> Which is true. Because they take their work home in the apartment and work, you know. I mean, it's surrounded by small towns, Manessa, you know. But that's the place where the guy who had the money and wanted to do it, that's where he lives, and that's the buildings he owns. So that's why it's there, you know. But 23 years, they come from all over the world, you know, to the school. So I think it's a raging success. Mm -hmm. How many students are there? Right now, I have no idea. About 200. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that means first semester, second year. That's all the semesters. Yeah. Film and everything. Oh, I thought you were raising your hand. <laughs> Again, a question? This is only as good as your question. Okay? Yeah. I have yeah, go ahead. Uh, I see you sculpture a lot of monsters and zombies and things of that nature. Like, you know, right at, at this time now, like ghosts and things of that nature that you do it in editing, you know, things of like that nature. How would, you, how would you use, like, the sculpting ability to make a ghost? A ghost? Yeah, and kind of. Well, it's pretty general, you know, it depends. Yeah. I mean, the script might not, sometimes the script is explicit on what they want. Sometimes it isn't. On Creepshow, it said, we see a blur of fur and teeth. That's it. So I was, it was, the, the, was wide open for me to sculpt something or sketch something, you know. It depends on what, the, what kind of ghost the script is asking for, you know. There's well, a right, billion ways to sketch. Practical thing, like you actually see it or if it's just Yeah, like it's being okay, you know. Did you ever see the movie Ghost Story that Dick Smith did? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Just those, watched that two nights ago. Ghosts are mm -hmm. scary as. The, the, but, but those are like. The you know, actual physical. Yeah. You know. But I mean, uh, I could stand here with a piece of glass and angle it in such a way that you would see Jerry in the glass, but he would be transparent. Right. You could see right through him because it's a reflection. But if you're a camera shooting that and don't know there was glass there, like the, big, the glass is big behind me, Jerry's a ghost standing right here. He's not here, he's over there. Sometimes that's what we do in films to create a ghost, you know. I did it on stage. 
um, at the Prince at the City Theater, I did Dracula, and uh, I turned Dracula into a bat right on stage. The audience couldn't believe believe it, and it was just a sheet of plexiglass they weren't aware of. Yeah, you know, plexiglass at like a forty-five degree angle in a hallway of a a, a doorway leading to a sanitarium. So Dracula is standing where Jerry's standing, and the guy with the bat is back here. When the lights are on Dracula, that's what you're seeing reflected in the plexiglass. You can't see me. You can't see the bat. But by cross-fading the lights from Jerry to me standing there, and again, you don't know the glasses there, it, the, the, by cross-fading the lights, he disappears, and the bat's there flapping its wings before it flies off. It's an old carnival trick where they used to turn a girl into a gorilla or something, you know. It's called the shutter effect, the blue room effect, you know. But that's what I did to train Dracula into him. In fact, at one point, the bat flies in, turns into Dracula, then he disappears. And the doorway opens in front of the hallway. A chair moves on the set. And as far as you're concerned, Dracula came in, went invisible, walked in and sat in the, in the room. This is just mechanical devices to tell the story, to make you believe something, you know. And that was great fun, because that was live on stage every night, and the audience completely flipped, yeah. You're not supposed to see stuff like that on stage, yeah. Well, working with a director, and uh, do you prefer him to be very specific and give you, like, the desires, or uh, do you prefer, like... You're talking about the director? Yeah, well, well like, how do you prefer to work? Do you prefer, like, you know, the director to be very specific and give you, like, the desires of the monsters and everything? Absolutely. Or, in fact, um, I tell the students and anybody that's working in the industry, because that's what we do, you get the script, the script says we see 12 bodies lying on the floor against the wall. So I always say, ask the director on every single effect, what do you want to see? You know, because he might say, oh, well, I don't need 12 bodies, I only need two, we're going to use a mirror, and the mirror will multiply them. You know, sort of you building 12 bodies, you know? That's why you ask the director about every single thing, every single effect. What do you want to see? And then that's all you got to build. But I prefer to know exactly what to do. But for example, on the creation of monsters, like you say in Crypto, it was very ambiguous and you have to kind of create everything. Do yeah. you prefer that or...? So well, that, well, no, that's great fun too because uh, I asked a bunch of my artist friends to do some sketches of what fluffy should look like. Some were insects, some were like creatures from the Black Lagoon things, you know. And I did some sketches, and we gave all the sketches to Stephen King and George Romero. He picked one of my sketches, and that's why Fluffy looks the way he does. So I love when, uh, and, and George Romero was famous for doing that. And I mentioned this at the last meeting if you were there. Uh, he would let you improvise as an actor, as a special effects guy. If you came up with something that was a good idea, yeah, go do it. Because a good director listens to everybody. Doesn't do everything everybody can, but picks the best ideas. Because one person can't think of everything. You know. Am I missing anybody? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so when you're creating a character out of like kind of like a vague kind of bit in the script, do you guys usually do sketches and stuff first to have the director choose, or would you rather prefer to present a tactile like this is what we've created? Like I don't know how much how many hours like yeah. that would take to, to make it, and then they would. Denied. Well, sometimes you do. Sometimes you do actually make a, a small version. Of, it's called a maquette, just for them to approve, you know. Oh, that's what you want? Okay, then we'll build the full size one. And that happens all the time. But sketches, because, you know, you're not making, you're not spending a lot of money, you're not making big mistakes, like on a set, you know. So, it's, yeah, it's great to uh, let them pick something, and then you know, you know what you have to do. And then, of course, they're there, seeing it being built. Hey, can he have bigger fangs? What about his eyes? Can they be bigger, you know? So I can put a light on his eye, you know? So you're always getting input. And the worst thing is when you build something that they want, and they say, well, can, it, can its lips move? No, you didn't ask for that. Okay, you didn't do Anybody else? Who's your, uh, in 23 years, who would you say is your top three or your most successful student? Well, that's, that's hard to say. No, maybe it's not so hard. Yeah, there's a few out there right now. Tate Sizenick, Kevin Kirkpatrick, Darren Holt. There's quite a few that have been out there and make, making names for themselves already. Nora Hewitt won Face Off. Um, she's constantly working out there, you know. 
But the, the, it seems that the ones who are out there and working have this passion. They always had this passion. And they were cons consistently persistent. You know, that seems to what help. Because you can't just sit around and wait for them to call you. They're not going to do that. You've know? you got to put yourself in front of people. So 23 years, that's impossible. You know? Yeah, we've had so many success stories. I went out to the Monsa Palooza convention back in 2019, mm -hmm. and I was bombarded with students that I had totally lost track of, and they were all working, and they were all thanking me at the school for teaching them because they had wonderful careers, and it was just amazing. I had no idea there were so many success stories. Allie, we need to change that line on the school that says anything but ordinary. Okay. We need to change that to we change lives. Okay. I, I will go back to the office and tell them. Because it's so true. Anything but ordinary is so bland. We change lives. That's important, you know. And it's true because we do, you know. Other questions? No. Oh, well, thanks, you guys. Well, thank you for coming. Yeah.